Good day and welcome to today's Capital One Listening and Leading webinar. We are pleased to offer a discussion on Bracing for Impact, Strategies for Supporting and Hosting Events in Winter and Spring 2021. It's part one for the College Division members. This is part of, this is one discussion that we're gonna be having. We're gonna be having another one next week and we'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, later on. It's gonna be geared more towards the NCAA Division I members. Uh, for today, we'd like to welcome our presenters, and this is just an outstanding panel. It covers all aspects and all gambits of not only sports information, but also administration, and you know, we are so honored to have this group with us today. First off, Lonnie Folks, he's the Director of Athletics and Recreation at Maryville University, a Division II school. Uh, then we have Jordan Hoover, he's the Assistant AD for Facilities and Operations at Catholic University. Uh, great to have Kevin Maloney joining us from Jones College. He's the Assistant AD for Sports Information. He's the 2Y SIDA president as well. So it's great to have, you know, Kevin joining us from the two-year uh, college group. And then uh, Denise Wojciak from Keene University. She's not only the Director of Sports Medicine, but also the SWA. So she wears two hats that we are going to be leaning very heavily on today. To hear some great things and i'm jim powers from maryville university and i'm also part of the cosida programming uh, continuing education committee and i'll be your moderator for today uh, we appreciate everybody joining us uh, before we begin we'd like to say a quick thank you to our corporate partner capital one the presenting sponsor of cosida's continuing educational series as a reminder the on-demand webinar will be posted later on today on cosida.com and cosida's youtube channel we will also have this as a podcast, and you'll be able to download it from the services listed on cosida.com. Please invite your colleagues to listen and watch the on-demand webinar as it's free for everybody. We've got a ton of questions already, and we want to thank those folks that submitted questions. If you have any questions during the session today, we encourage you to submit them in the chat box, and we will work our way through all of these great questions. And so. Without further ado, we're going to jump right into this thing. And, you know, COVID has just absolutely, you know, thrown monkey wrenches and curveballs and everything into, you know, what we're doing and how we're doing things. And so the first question, and we'll start with Lonnie on this, we'll go from the AD's chair and we'll work our way through, is what's the hardest part about transitioning sports, Lonnie, into a COVID world and, you know, what we're dealing with right now? Uh, thank you, first of all, Jim, and thanks to COSIDA for, for having me on this. I enjoy going back to my roots, if you will. I think uh, Jim knows for sure that I got I cut my teeth in the athletics business doing a little sports information, and so I appreciate everything that all of you uh, people from COSIDA and all the SIDs do, so thank you, and, and just keep up the good work from that. As it relates to, uh, to the question, it's for me, it's just about managing expectations. You know, so so I sit in my office and uh, and and I so I've got administrators, the president of the university, and and especially at at our place at Maryville, my president is so involved. My president knows the name of our athletes, knows their backgrounds, knows how well they're doing if they had a bad contest, and so he's heavily involved in athletics. But he's also unbelievably smart, and he's also very very strategic in how he goes about protecting our entire campus community, right? So we've got about 3,000 on the ground students. We have another 7,000 or so online, but we got about 3,000 on the ground students. And between, between intercollegiate athletics and our varsity club sports, just under 700 of those report to me. So the, the president and the administrators are like, look, this is what we wanna do to keep our community safe, including all of our athletes. The coaches are like, when can we practice? When can we practice? When can we practice? And the kids are like, coach, when are we going to get to do anything other than one-on-one -on -one or just weightlifting? And so I'm in the middle just trying to manage their attention, understanding, coming from a coaching background, understanding like, yeah, the kids want to play. You know, we want them to get educated and they're getting educated, but they want to play and, and trying to do that, but also trying to help them to understand. And as we go through, you know, what we're finding is that the coaches reluctantly get it right they're going like okay yeah you're you're probably right i wish and you know the one thing that i always deal with is that well everybody's doing it this school is doing it i, I don't care i want to know about what's going to work here 
and, and going through that. But it's really by managing the expectations all the way around for us. No doubt about it. And, and Jordan, you know, on the facilities side of things, you know, what are what's been the hardest part for you on the facilities and operations side? I think for us, it's just, you know, Larry mentioned it. It's there's so many new wrinkles now. There's so many layers of, of what we all do in athletics and, you know, my office specifically with facilities and operations. There are so many different ways. Each sport has a different set of protocols in a normal world that we're working through and, and how, you know, to make every event and a facility successful. But now it's just, it's adding extra wrinkles of things that, you know, hey, you, know, you have to think about how do you get teams to locker rooms or, or you know, what's their pathway through the building? Those are things that we never had to think about previously. Where now it's it's a new wrinkle you have to take time and consider. And like Lonnie said, how do we do it safely? Is it is there a way that we need to do it better next semester for them or going down in the fall semester? So it's just a lot of additional wrinkles adding to, to what we're already doing just to make sure, you know, again, people are going through the building safely. We can have folks competing safely. And it's just, it's just adding, you know, a little bit, a little bit different kind of perspective and things on stuff that we normally do just in a different way and it's, it's a heightened sense of making sure everyone's safe and, and how can we do this to to make sure everyone is getting the experience they want but they can do it safely as well and jordan this just isn't just for the indoor sports <clears throat> excuse me this is for the outdoor sports as well correct Correct. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, for us, one thing we've done here is implemented a one-way pathway in and outside of the building. So there's, you know, there's one way to get in, one way to get out. And it's, you know, every sport and every facility is different, but it's, you know, trying to make a standard across the board that, you know, all of our athletes and coaches and staff members can all follow. Because, you know, again, it's, there's so many things going on. There's so many different challenges that you want to kind of have a standardized approach across the board. So it's, it's not just the indoor sports with basketball and volleyball and some others. It's, you know, making sure that our lacrosse team can get safely through our building through our temperature check station out to our fields to, to make sure they're safe to practice and coming back in and, and not you know crossing paths or contaminating and, and those kind of things so it's yeah, it's it's sport wide no doubt and kevin you know me and you can speak on the sid side of things but i'll let you go you know go with it you know it, we know what our challenges are tell everybody what you see some of the, your challenges in transitioning into this covid world I think one of the best things of advice that I got was to to prepare, don't plan, because the second that you you, you have something set up, uh, it's going to flip your world upside down. I mean, for example, it's homecoming week for us. We're supposed to play a homecoming game tonight. Yesterday, we found out that the team that we're playing has canceled their remaining three games. That throws everything, in, you know, into a completely different uh, world. Um, so. A lot of things, you know, I try to think outside the box. I mean, when it comes to just even with pictures, you know, the, the whole mask mandate, I mean, things that I don't think about when it comes to I'm taking a picture uh, of an athlete at practice, but 60 yards away, there's a student trainer with no mask on. And I post that picture and I don't think anything about it, but it's just trying to remember, hey, things that were normal are not normal anymore. Like if you're not, you have to be able to look outside the box and I think the biggest thing that I've tried to follow is prepare, don't plan, and that no matter what, uh, there's going to be something thrown in there that you're not expecting. So I know in the sports information world, we're usually pretty good at multitasking. So when stuff comes on us last minute, usually we can adjust, but that's not so simple for a lot of people. So, you know, for us, it may come more naturally, but for others, they may be panicking when we're like, hey, we got this. We, we've been through this before. So it's just trying to prepare as much as you possibly can and knowing that something will will change what you have already planned. And then, Denise, I think other than, you know, the AD and everybody is important, but athletic training right now in the COVID area, it, it's got to be, you know, right now the most important part of this whole equation. And it's so funny because I actually said the other day, I can't wait to do athletic training again. Like I feel like it as as important as we are, we're not really doing our job right now, which is a huge challenge. Um, I was just saying before everybody got on, we did our testing today. So my job all day now is gathering test results, doing contact tracing, not dealing with an athlete and their injury. So um Right now, we don't have sports going on. We just have practices, so we don't have any games, and we're still having some challenging times. We still have coaches who are like, what do you mean they can't practice? Okay, you're practicing just to have something to do right now. It's not practicing 
for a game you have in three days. So I can't even imagine the challenges that athletic trainers are going to have when we are participating in sports and, oh, sorry, you have to cancel your game tomorrow because you had three guys test positive. So I think that's going to be our biggest challenge. Um, and then I posed a question to the athletic directors in our conference. I was like, you know, all of you are going around saying the athletic trainers are doing the testing right now, and I am as well. What happens when I have all 14 sports going on and there's not enough time for us to do testing as well? And they all are just kind of like, hmm, yeah, that's a great question. So there has to be some thought of what are we going to do? Are you going to hire other people to do the testing? I know we've talked to our coaches about you're going to have to help with the testing aspect of it. It's not a medical thing. They're they're doing a saliva test. The athlete does it all. So the coaches are probably going to have to get more involved in that. And we're fortunate that we have almost all of our coaches as full time that we can put that on them. But I know a lot of other schools can't. But it's um, Kevin. Oh, no, no. I was, was going to follow what Denise was saying. Oh. And there's some, there's something that probably you probably may or may not think about. Like, what if you get COVID? Because right. it's funny, nobody on our football team has had COVID. We've got one game left on the season. But our athletic trainer, our head trainer, got COVID and she's out 14 days. So we actually, we have um, Hattiesburg Sports Medicine that is over our entire department, but some of their people had to come here for that two week period. So it's just like, even you and your profession, you're the one doing the testing and, and the contact tracing, but what happens when you get it? And then it's mm -hmm. like, that throws everything else into a wrench too. Absolutely. And we've had to have discussions about having per diem money and having per diems available in case that does happen. Cause it's very possible. And in our world, if one of us goes down, all of us are probably going to go down because we're all dealing with the same people in the same room. So that's definitely a challenge. And just the challenge of the coaches thinking because we're the athletic trainer, we have all of the answers. And I think that's a great big. point, especially as it, relates, as it relates to the testing and, 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 and what Kevin brought up, because we had a situation of one of the people in our athletic training staff as well with an athlete that was injured in a competition. And so the trainer stayed there and was tending to the athlete. And then later we find out that the athlete tested positive. So now the trainer's done, you know, and and, and you go through that. And, and we're looking at the same sort of thing here, Mary Brothers, that once we start competing, we have a few sports that are starting to compete, but come January when everyone else is competing and the whole universe is, we're gonna have all these teams competing and we're gonna start doing all of this testing. It's like, there's literally not enough hours in a day for our staff to do all of the testing. And so we're looking at the per diem model as well as bringing people in. Uh, but now Denise has turned me on to something. I might, some these coaches that are complaining about playing, somebody, well, here's how you're gonna get to play. You're gonna do all of the testing and stuff and we'll, we'll figure it out. So thank you, Denise. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, th this is a great transition because, you know, I, a lot of people may have plans, but but some people may not. And so, you know, Lonnie, we'll start with you. You know, what is the plan if COVID-19 forces either you or members of the staff into quarantine? And especially, you know, for some, you know, colleges and universities that are short staffed already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what, this is, and this is, this is what I've learned in my advanced age. You know, even as we go through this and we're reaching the people and reaching the multitudes is that technology has advanced so much farther than when it was you know, because when this thing first started up, when we first figured out what COVID was, right, my whole staff and most of the campus, we were working from homes. And so, but we, but I was able, actually I was happy to get back to work because it seemed like I was more busy while I was at home because everybody knew that I was sitting around waiting for my computer to bang, but we're able to still navigate and, and go through the things and get work done and, and make connections with people without physically being here. And so that's been that's been a positive thing. The challenge, so the challenge isn't like, well, can we get the administrative aspects of it done? The answer to that is absolutely yes. However, you can't play a basketball game over a computer. You know, it just, you know, you uh, you know, I know they have those, they have Maddens and all the other things, but but our kids want to go out and they want to guard somebody, you know, our you know, our soccer players want to try to go out and score goals. And so that be that becomes a challenge part, you know. Uh, you can, I mean, we've had coaches try to get creative and so it's like what they're doing with training wise and they're having Zoom sessions and try to do things and stuff like that. But it's just, it's it's difficult from 
the, 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 the physical aspects of what it is from the sports, but as far as administrative goals, you know, we're, we're able to, we're fortunate with the technology that we're still able to get things done. And so I'm, I'm thankful for, for the technology gurus that we're able to get things done like that. You know, and, and let's flip that over to Denise, you know, obviously you, you kind of touched on it a little bit, you know, on, on different things, but what are some of those other things that you guys are looking into when it comes to, you know, if somebody goes into quarantine or, you know, because all of us may be short staffed at some point. Yeah, it's it's a tough question. And, you know, I'm fortunate that I do have a pretty large staff right now. It's four full time certified athletic trainers and a grad assistant. So right now we're alternating days. So if one group goes down, we still have another group. But moving forward, if we're practicing, we have to all be there six days a week. So we're going to have to look at per diem people. We're going to have to call our alumni and see who's around, who can give us a couple hours here and there. And you know, it's scheduling is probably going to become a nightmare as we have to change games. And now instead of having three home games, we have four home games and lacrosse is on the road and football's on the road and I don't have enough people. So what are we going to do? So it's just making the administration aware that there are going to be those challenges and we need to have the resources. If they're going to let us play, we need to have the resources to be able to cover what needs to be covered. Kevin, your side of the house on this? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, uh, you know, I've, I'm in more communication with, with my sub supervisors than I've ever been before. You know, I'm, I'm confident in my ability. They obviously pay us to do what we do. And a lot of times, they, hey, they let, they let us work. And we know in the end, hey, you don't have to worry about Kevin's side, sports information, we're good. But now I've had to say, okay, you know, I have to adjust some because it's not just me. I have to make sure that everybody else is on the same page. But with the coaches, we've kind of told them that, you know, we're going to have to start scheduling stuff out. You know, when it comes to live streams, uh, what games we can and can't cover, we're probably not going to be able to travel this year. And unfortunately, in two-year junior college athletics, you probably think I'm crazy, but there are still teams that do paper stats. I mean, there's only two or three of us in this league that do it manually on a computer i use stat crew nobody else in our league uses stat crew so things that usually you would think oh you know they'll just go to the other event and they'll send them the pack file it does not work that way we're having to go back and watch the game somebody's statting it in in the dugout whatever so we're just having to tell the coaches ahead of time it's nothing like we've ever experienced before you know if we can't come to an event you can't take it personally you know, we we expect, you know, luckily for us, we're playing football right now. We'll be done in, in, in two weeks, but everything else is in the spring. We're going to have at least six events a week. I'm fortunate we have two SIDs, myself and Sean Wansley, but we just got to tell them ahead of time, hey, this is our schedule for the week. This is what, what games we plan to live stream. This is who we expect to be there, what student workers will be there, and, and kind of go from there. And, and we know that you're gonna have rain outs in baseball and rain outs in softball and, and some another team could, could test positive. Uh, so I think it's just everybody on the same page knowing you will have to adjust in one way or the other. No doubt. To piggyback. No, go ahead, Denise. Sorry. Just to piggyback off of that, we normally travel with our sports. So we have enough staff where we've always had somebody assigned to the sports. They go to all their games, they're their athletic trainer. And so um in the fall with one of the practices our field hockey coach was like so um you guys going to be at our practice i was like no there's two of us there's all of you practicing no it's it's a very different world this year so they understand they're not going to have somebody traveling unless it's football or men's lacrosse and you know it's going to be home game coverage because that's all we could do right now and and just one more thing is in my mind but like with the supervisors what i've told my immediate boss is i said all, all I said, I said it for like a week ago, I said, just have my back. Whatever whatever we do, whatever goes down this year, there's going to be some gripes from, I'm sure, from parents, from coaches, from everyone, because we're all on edge. Look, we get it. We're all frustrated. We all, you know, every hour something's changing, every five minutes. I just told my immediate boss, I said, just have my back and, and feel like I've got your support and, and we'll get through it. No doubt. Jordan, let's get you into the conversation. 
Yeah, I mean, for me, one of the things and kind of the realization you have to come through really soon with athletic training and, and facilities and events is we're interacting with so many people. There's a really high chance that one of us, whether it's myself or my graduate assistant or, or someone on our staff is going to get it. So really, for me, it's kind of preparing for that, like, you know, preparing, knowing that there's a really good chance that there's a, a time that I might go down. So kind of doing a little bit of extra prep work in the, the beforehand and saying, OK, if if this is a two week absence, I have to take these are all the things that x person needs to, to be successful and, and obviously i'll be there virtually to be helpful as, as, as helpful as i can but really it's it's for me now is trying to prepare and get everything kind of together now for for someone that might have to step into my role for two weeks or, or, or whatever it may be or if i have to step into someone else's so there's been a lot of communication with our staff of saying you know there's like you know kind of like Kevin's saying it's going to be different this year coaches may have to help cover games or i might have to help athletic training with testing and you know multiple things like that so it's really just kind of preparing to know that at some point we've been very fortunate right now we've had no staff members test positive at some point we likely will in the spring because that's just the nature of the beast of of what's going on so it's really preparing now to say okay well what can i do to have a Denise step into my role and kind of fill in for me while I'm out, I can help her virtually, but what can I prepare for her and to give her to say, this is what you need to be successful. This is how you need to run a soccer game, football game, or whatever it may be. So I think it just takes even more preparation now to in the, in the kind of the forefront before we get into this to say, okay, it's, it's likely it's going to happen. So how can I prepare my colleagues to kind of fill in and help out? And one of the things, Jim, one of the things, if I, if I may, you know, yeah, as we, as we go through, and, and and we look at this. So so I'm on here, and I'm 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 here, I'm here from the facilities person, sports information, and Denise with athletic training. So pick a sport that we have, whatever it is, you know, be it be it soccer, wrestling, whatever, basketball. So our coaches got their 16 to 19 weeks, right? That they got their traditional and non-traditional season. And yes, they're doing recruiting and stuff like that, and they go through. But between facilities and sports information and athletic training. There's no 16 to 19 weeks, and then you get to sit back and wait for it, right? You're going on, on, and so it's very important. And again, just because I happen to come through a different route, it's very important for for not just people in my position, but anyone who are decision makers in athletics administration to understand the roles of the people that that we're hearing from. Is that look, there's not, you know, there's not like okay. I'm gonna be up, you know, my kid got sick, I'm, you know, so I'm gonna turn the practice over to my assistant coach today, you know, or anything like that, or, or it's like, you know what, we're gonna cancel practice today because I don't feel good. Well, our athletic trainer isn't gonna say, we're gonna cancel this football game today because I got a doctor's appointment. You know, so we have to, we as administrators have to understand is that, you know, it's it's those backline people and that, you know, but, and, but that don't get any of the glory or anything like that, except that, except that our athletes really do understand that. And I think our coaches do for the most part, but this is a time that we can really, really just reinforce that a little bit more. It's like, look, this is what, this is what these people are doing. You know, when you're, when you're going, when you're working from home two, three days a week, you know, our SIDs are doing this, our trainers are doing this, our facilities person is still trying to get stuff squared away with all of our student employees and things. And that's one of the things that I feel good about in my, in my role, but it's one of the things I want to underscore as well for any any other administrators that are there, and I'm I'm sure that we all understand that. But I couldn't I couldn't miss the opportunity to say that I understand that and I embrace what it is you do and the importance of helping us to understand the value of what you bring to the table. Well, this is leading into the next question, and once again, I mean, this is just transitioning. You know, I should have a script. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. You know. How do you guys manage the expectations with with your supervisors and with your coaches? I know we've kind of talked a little bit about it, you know, and, and I'll throw this one thing in. What we're doing is what I've done is I've compiled all the schedules, you know, for the spring. And then, you know, Lonnie and myself and a few others are going to sit down and look at those and kind of see, OK, what do we need help here? Where do we need help there? and go down that line. So that's kind of one of the things that we're doing here at Maryville. But, you know, I know there's a lot of expectations with the supervisors and the coaches and a lot of different things. And you guys have kind of touched on that. So, you know, Lonnie, I'll start with you. Why don't you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, yeah. it's it's real simple for us. It's communication, right? We know that we have, and, and especially now with our indoor sports, all of our teams are going to be playing in February and March. Everybody's going to be playing. And so how do you do that? We got, you know, I got Jim and I got Chuck Young. So we got two people and a GA in sports information. 
but everybody wants to know is a staff person going to be at a game? Well, no, it's not going to happen. You know, but but it's going to be as Jim said. So we're looking at we're going to be to, just today, I believe we're going to be looking at all of our swing schedules. And I've told our coaches is that all of the game times and the game dates are tentative because we're going to look at it. And we're fortunate because our facility layout that we can host multiple home events in a day, but we can't host four home events in a day that, all, that are all starting at the same time. We're just not set up for that. So we're going to have to tweak and, and we want to do it now in November so that it's not so we can we can reach out to our opponents. Re and most of them are going to be conference opponents. They're going to be having the same situations. So it's just a matter of communication. I have people like Jim that are like, look, I've got all these schedules. This is where I see that they're, if they're not red marks, you know, red spots, they're at least yellow spots, caution. And we look and go like, OK, what can we move? How can we make this? You know, sometimes it's just a matter of moving them the game a half an hour, an hour, sometimes man, like, can we play on a different day? But it's all about communication. Jordan, bring that question to you. Yeah, I mean, I'll echo what Lonnie said. It's definitely communication. And for us, it's been a lot of transparency. You know, it's it's constant conversation with our coaches and say, look, like, look around the, the country. There are a lot of schools that are saying, you know what, we're out, we're not going to do it. But we're, we're one of the very few and, and others on this call are very fortunate to say that we're moving forward. We're going to do everything we can to possibly to make our athletes have games. Let's, have, let's do something in the spring, whether it's full competitions or scrimmages or whatever it may be. So one of the things that we've tried to harp with all, a lot of our coaches is to say, look, like, see the landscape. We're, you know, we, we should be we should feel very fortunate and, and be very open. Like, we're going to do absolutely everything we can to, to get as many games as we can. But there's got to be flexibility. So, you know, your coaches need to understand that there's going to be things that change. Like Lonnie mentioned, times are going to be tentative. There might be games that get pulled out. Athletes are not going to be able to play because they're they're testing positive. So it's really just being open and honest with the coaches from day one saying, look, like we're we're committed to doing this, but it's going to look different. So coaches need to understand that it's going to be a little different than what it is. But we're going to be one of the fortunate ones that have an opportunity to play and to, and to do things where others are not. So it's just kind of making sure that they understand the landscape of, of what's going on and, and kind of feeling their partners out. As I know Lonnie mentioned earlier, I don't care what other schools are doing. And that's, that's the approach that we've taken. You know, we, we, we will control what we can control at Catholic University of America. We can't control what any of our conference schools are doing and even further outside of that. So we're going to control what we control and just – have coaches temper their expectations to look, you know, if we get to play a game or multiple games, we're, we're very fortunate. Kevin, why don't you chime in on that for us? Yeah, I'm just writing down some notes as we go here too. I, I, same thing, same thing on you, Jim. It's the, uh, we looked at our composite calendar and that's something that we tell our coaches as well. It's like, all right, there is one day I know in, I think April, we have soccer, baseball and softball all at home, all the same day. We got, I mean, I'll know that way ahead of time to tell you, hey, you obviously know there's two of us and there's three events going on. Something's got to give. Um, it's, but it's like I said that earlier, it's, it's preparing. And so, you know, we'll look at that composite calendar and we'll know. And the other thing is like, you know, I told you about junior college athletics is different as far as somebody providing a game file or something like that. So I'll know who we play in the league. I hope you hear my computer going on and off here. <laughs> is that what it was? I think we lost Kevin. Let, Denise, let's go to you on that. We'll we'll pick back up with Kevin here in a minute. Yeah, I mean, I agree with the planning of it. I think the biggest challenge from my perspective has been coaches expecting like definitive answers of everything immediately. Like I have a book that I can open to page 32 and give you an answer to that question. Like we're all figuring it out as we go. And Dr. Hainlein, the chief medical officer of the NCA said it best. He said, nobody got trained in COVID. Like the doctors didn't have a class in COVID in med school. The athletic trainers didn't have a class in COVID in school. Like we're all kind of figuring it out as we go. And same thing that Jordan and Lonnie said with, you know, other schools doing different things like we have within our conference very conservative very aggressive i'm somewhere in the middle and coaches are complaining and i said i don't care the athletes are safe and that's what's important to me um we're sticking with what we're doing and my administration supports me a hundred percent so it's been that's been a huge positive for us kevin yeah i'm glad to have you back there go <laughs> ahead and your thoughts <laughs> well i will say i hate to give bad love to the IT folks here, but we have had more internet problems in the last probably six months than I've ever experienced in my life. So we'll probably cut it out in and out here. Um, the one thing I was saying though, before I got cut off was about the composite calendar, which I think you touched on there. 
it's being able to look ahead and know, you know, when you're playing, who you're playing. And for us in junior college, uh, sports formation as a whole, you know that the opponent you play, if they have a good SID or if they can provide live stats, live video, whatever they provide. So I'll know, hey, if we're going to X opponent and, and we know that, hey, it's a, you know, they don't have internet there or they don't have a sports information director at their game. Their sports information director is also their assistant baseball coach. Uh, which we have a couple of those in the league. So we can always look ahead and say, hey, we'll need to travel to that game or we'll have nothing. And then, of course, we'll look at it as conference games will, of course, trump over the non-conference games. Like if we have a non-conference soccer with a conference baseball or softball going on, we're obviously going to show our love to the conference events. And uh, But that's a lot of it. You know, they, They've told us that they do not want us to travel this year, but there are – there are parts of that that makes it more difficult. I mean, it, it, you know, having to go back and watch a game or try to go through a coach's, you know, scorekeeping book, my goodness. And you and you can't remember, like you think about it, I may be on the phone with them at 11 o'clock at night going over a play in the third inning, a double steal. They're not going to remember that. If I'm there and I'm live, I got it. And so there are some benefits of, of us traveling, but I feel like it's going to be the coaches know this year, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. You're going to have to have a manager, probably keep a book from time to time, whether that's soccer, baseball, softball, uh, basketball, at least we can go back and watch uh, those games. But it, it's just the composite calendar, I think is a really great tool. And I, I mean, I would think in 2020, everybody's athletic website gives you that ability to look at your composite calendar and look ahead. Outstanding. Well, let's, uh, Let's jump in, and I think this is a great question, and it was just submitted to us. What is the biggest challenge for each of our professions for this spring, for the spring semester? What, what in your mind, is going to be the biggest challenge? And, you know, Jordan, I'll start with you. What is probably going to be your biggest challenge in the COVID era for the spring semester? I think from a facilities and events perspective specifically, it's just they're going to be new wrinkles every day. I mean, there are, there are going to be things that that I can't even plan on that are going to pop up and just managing kind of managing those things and and putting out fires even more so than we do already and, you know, on, on multiple fronts. So I think it's going to be things you know, like I mentioned earlier that we just we don't normally have to plan for or, or pop up and, and we can prepare and, and, you know, have a great game plan. But until we actually get into the place of playing games of and, and the, the new COVID world, like, we really don't know. So there are going to be things that are going to pop up, you know, all the time and say, OK, well, what do we do here? It's going to be a lot of very quick decisions that are going to be, need to be made, which, you know, is kind of what our landscape is normally in athletics. But it's just a whole other set of, of problems now we're going to have to, to deal with um, in, in that regard. And then the other thing for me is really just you know, we have 25 sports. So having 25 sports competing in one, in one semester is, is a lot. So it's kind of tempering those expectations with coaches of saying, you know, I know. You know, football coach actually usually get three hours of your practice, but I can't provide that for you. You know, we have a, a certain amount of time each day to get these 25 sports in or, or whatever you know, number of sports you may have. So it's it's really kind of managing those relationships with coaches. So it's, it's there's going to be a lot of, of work that needs to be done now and in the background to, to kind of set the stage to say, you know what, hey, like I understand, like, I know the challenges, but there's, it's going to be different. So it's just kind of managing those expectations with coaches even now and in the next semester of saying, okay, well, things are going to be different. How can we make it so you're getting what you need, but we can also provide for other sports as well? We'll go to Denise, and I know what the first part of the challenge is going to be, and obviously that's going to be all the testing and everything. But, you know, Denise, you also wear the SWA hat. You know, go ahead. Let's transition out of training over to SWA. You know, what's going to be a challenge for an SWA this year, especially in the spring semester? Oh, um, it's making sure everybody's getting treated the same, being fair and equitable to everyone. I mean, we have, we're going to have to move some sports that usually practice in the arena they play in to a different area because we have so many practices going on, making sure that the women's basketball team and the men's basketball team are having the same um, the same opportunities in practice same thing with our men's volleyball team and women's volleyball team inside so you know we're having to actually alternate practice weeks so like one of them's at the other campus one week one of them's at the campus the other week and then we're gonna have to go through day by day and if they have a game the next day give them an opportunity to be in the arena where they're playing so that's going to shift other people around so just making sure that we're not 
given somebody more than everybody else. And that's going to be a huge challenge, making sure 14 teams are getting the same thing as opposed to what's normally five or six. Evan, what's, what do you feel your, you know, the challenges for the SIDs are going to be in the spring? Uh, one, one I would say is a personal challenge and one is a, a profession challenge. Like I, I'm a perfectionist. I'm a people pleaser. If any of you have ever done the Enneagram, I'm a number one. I'm a rule follower. And so like, I just, I have a plan, you know, I, I have a, li a to-do list. Like, I mean, I'm prepared and not being able to provide what we typically provide is my biggest challenge you know you're going to have parents that want every single game live streamed. Uh, you know, it may sometimes it may take a couple days for a stats to get entered to the national website, but it's just it's it's having to understand that like usually I would really let that weigh on me that hey you know this parent was upset we couldn't get this one live streamed, but I have to tell myself personally that hey it's okay and don't let it affect you personally. But I guess the the other the biggest challenge work wise to me is just being able to staff everything. I mean, we at a junior college alone, we're small as it is. I mean, luckily we have myself and another SID and we have four student workers, but you're talking about six events a week. You, you know, you never know what's going to happen with those students. One of them could come down with COVID. Our first football game, I lost two of my four students. So I had to scramble. I was supposed to do two or three different camera angles for football. We only got to do one that first game. It's like, that's going to happen, but it's like, I got to tell myself not to get, like, typically I'd be very frustrated, just like probably everybody else would be, but I've got to tell myself, look, it's, it's just how it is. And to not just like, it, it gives you anxiety and, you know, you kind of feel like you're beating up on yourself, but um, it just being, being able to staff everything, I think is my biggest concern. Um, I mean, you got to think about it from, from all of our perspective, a, a soccer match, you're talking about having, Two people run cameras, a broadcaster, somebody running the scoreboard, somebody taking pictures. I mean, that that's just for a soccer match. So that's my fear is that we're not going to be able to staff things. And where do you go to get help? Yeah, and I'll kind of jump in on that too. I know one of the concerns that I've had with talking to my base of student workers has been a lot of my workers are athletes. And, you know, a lot of them have expressed concern of saying, hey, I don't know if I want to work in the springtime because I'm going to be in my season. And, you know, we have our own school and everything else. So that's one of the things that I've been working through of trying to build a right now is build a bigger student body to pull from. Because the reality is, you know, I'm going to have student athletes from other sports. that don't want to work the, the football game or the soccer game because they're also in season. They have practice they have school. So it's one of the things that I've had to do is really branch out further and try to find out try to find student workers that are not athletes. So other departments that are, that may have extra, you know, positions that they can't fill or, or, you know, other students that are looking for work, I've had to reach out with HR and work with them. So really it's, I mean, I would encourage everyone to, if you can put your fingers out there and try to find others that are really interested in sports, but maybe don't, that are not athletes, do that because it's, it's going to be a challenge for some of these kids that are, you know, having, having these internal struggles of, I want to work and I want to help and make money and help the department, but I also, I care about my sport. I care about athletics. I want to make sure that I'm taking care of that as well. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Following up with what Jordan was saying, you know, before we got on the call, I said I was out setting up for our softball fall World Series game too. Uh, and they have four managers. I didn't realize that softball had that many managers. And I had one guy, basically, I walked him through, had to set up the live stream. I said, look, you know, usually we have multiple camera angles. We have commercials, all those things. This is very vanilla. This is – how we do it today but i straight up said look i'm gonna call on you guys and girls during the season because i simply cannot staff everything and look i showed a guy here in the fall and we don't play for three months but now he knows how to at least hit live and and run a score bug and hit plus one minus one whatever that may be so i'm definitely going to tap into some of those managers that are already with those teams and just give them a heads up on the front end and say there may be a time we need you to run a camera for us or run our live stream pr production truck. So uh, I'm really going to take advantage of what Jordan had said. And that's the, that's the beauty of it is what, what you're talking about is that I think that everyone understands that and goes like, look, we're going to need you to do this. We're going to need coaches to help do contact tracing. We're going to need, you know, we're going to need students from other sports. We're going to need other students because all of our athletes now that are work study students for us, right? They're going to all be playing in the spring. So how do you feel that? For me, 
it's about anyone, any kind of success that I've had and anyone that's worked with me or for me has noticed that I'm a planner. I like to plan out. So in, in years past where you could plan out months in advance or certainly weeks in advance, you know, I came in this morning and turned on my computer and there's a note from the dean of students. The following athletes are permitted, restricted from being on campus because of this. So now I got to tell the coach who had a practice plan at 1030 this morning. It's like, well, you had a practice plan at 1030, but guess what? Eight of your kids aren't going to be available in there. And so, you know, and go, and so it's it's a matter of that the the part that you can't control, you can't control who's going to get sick. We do our best. We tell our kids, wear your mask, socially distance. So they're college kids. You know, they want to do and they don't, and they're invincible, right? These these 18 to 20 year old, 22 year olds, they're invincible. Nothing can go wrong in their lives, right? Absolutely. Don't worry about it, coach. Yes, it was a party, but we were all, we got an Uber. It's okay. You know, it's it's just a matter of not being not understanding like when's that next note gonna come from the Dean of Students? You know, how many is it gonna be one kid? Is it going to be 10 kids? You know, is it one positive kid who hung out with 10 teammates, so they're all gotta be isolated in quarantine, or is it just one kid who's off by themselves with their significant other and they're and they're and that person doesn't play a sport and they're a commuter, so you're good to go. And so it's that's the part that's challenging for, for me. It's just figuring out like when I come into the office from day to day, I don't know when I'm going to be faithful. It used to be, I always said, I said 20% of my time aside in each day to deal with something that I didn't think was going to happen when I walked into the office. Well, now I'm hoping that I can get to 20% of what I plan on getting getting to because of the unknown. And to piggyback on that, um, perfect example today, I had two positive cases. One team, he lives off campus, hasn't been around anybody else. He's the only person who had a quarantine. The other one lives with eight other people on his team. And now they all had a quarantine. And then by 30 minutes later, two more of them had tested positive. So it's it could go one way or the other. We had one case where we had to quarantine 22 people because one person tested positive. So it just, you never know. No doubt. Well, let's go to a few more questions here. Um, you know, Denise, I'll start with you on this one because it has to do more with uh, the tier one, tier two designations. Uh, the question is, would you consider SIDs as tier one or tier two staffers? And then is it inevitable that an SID trainer, et cetera, contacts the virus, contracts the virus and is placed in quarantine, but the game still must go on? Um, I believe that the game cannot go on without an athletic trainer or some type of medical professional covering it. Um, it could be an EMT, it could be the team doctor, but there has to be, the host school has to provide some sort of medical coverage for it. Um, in terms of tier one, tier two, athletic trainers, according to the NCAA, athletic trainers are considered tier one. Um, they are trying to set things up so the SIDs are considered tier two by keeping them separate from the bench. I know there's talk of putting um, the tables on the opposite side as the players, so there's not as much contact to eliminate some of that to allow them to be in the tier two category. Tier two on the books, but tier 0. 0.5 in the importance category again. Don't worry. No doubt. <laughs> All right, this question is going to be more towards uh, Kevin and myself, and Kevin's kind of touched on it a little bit, but I'm going to, you know, chime in a little bit as well. How do, you, how do we prioritize live streaming for multiple and simultaneous events? And, you know, most of the time, that falls into the SID lap. That doesn't fall into the AD. The AD is wanting us to make sure that we're doing what we need to do, you know, that the facilities person is there to help out if we need camera ops or anything along those lines. But the bottom line is, that normally falls on the SIDs, Kevin. Yeah, I mean, for us, you know, luckily we, on, on JCTV, we've got, of course, two channels. A lot of people that have live stream have, have a two-channel system, whether it's a, a black and gold channel or a maroon and white channel. You have multiple channels. And, you know, I'll tell you what, our softball team and baseball team in years past has had to just use Facebook Live. So worst case, you know, if it's if you have a conference game, we'll say on JCTV, and then you've got, you know, baseball or softball on Facebook Live. I mean, it, it's not great, you know, but at least it's something, you know, the, the parents that cannot travel, I, I guess that's how I would prioritize it. Like I said earlier was, is it a conference game? Maybe is it a playoff game? 
Uh, you know, it could be where you are in the standings, like, hey, it's, you know, the top two teams in division playing. Uh, I think that's kind of how you prioritize it. But you do have the two different channels. And and look, even if you don't have an announcer for those games, like just flipping on, like right now at the Softball World Series, there's no announcer, but you hear the audio, you hear the bat, you hear the ball, you hear the, the girls yelling back and forth. I mean, you at least you get that. So I would say as far as the live stream, look, just flip it on and leave the audio running and, and put a little sign on it that says recording so people know to not sit right next to the camera and, and talk the whole time because everyone will hear you. But I think that's how I would do it. I, I would prioritize based on conference, non-conference, and if you got the option to do a Facebook Live or on YouTube, or I think I think Par some people still do Periscope. So there's other options that aren't great quality, but at least you can see the picture and see what's going on. Yeah, and I know one of the things that we're going to do here, uh, you know, us here at Maryville and also our conference, we we use uh, Blueframe and we use Production Truck. Well, they just rolled out what's called Remote Truck that you can use on iPads and you know iPhones and all that stuff. So you know, I contacted our IT department and they were able to give us two iPads. And so now what that's going to be able to do is that's going to be able to take us from one broadcast now to three broadcasts in the spring. And, you know, that that's going to help us out. But, you know, one of the things that I also thought about was the Facebook Live. You know, I think what everybody needs to understand in, in this day and age this year, that things are going to be totally different. Things are not going to be what the normal used to be. Um, but, you know, we're able to at least put stuff out there and do the streaming that way if there's not a lot of fans if there's no fans at all we're at least able to come up with something to prioritize and to do the best that we can to get that stuff out there and we're going to be the same thing all but all of our stuff for the most part is going to be conference only so that's why we're going to make a very strong effort to uh, be able to stream everything um so that's on that let's go to uh, Lonnie, this is going to be more uh, towards you. Uh, how active are you in making a schedule so that you aren't having three or four sports at home at once? And is your conference giving you leeway to play weekday or neutral site doubleheaders? Yeah, so so as I, as I mentioned earlier, it's one of the things I'm going to get involved with that. And we talk about it as athletic directors within the GOVC is that we've all got to be flexible. And if we as athletic directors can, directors can come to an understanding then it's going to be easier for the coaches i have a very very capable team jim's involved with it for us at maryville as far as gathering all of the schedules in, putting all of the things in place and then looking to see like okay it's it's thursday afternoon we've got we've got two games going on they're separated by an hour and a half no problem but it's saturday it's saturday we've got five things going on and they all start within an, an hour of each other uh we get we have an issue there and going through and so we will look to do that and we have the wherewithal to a certain extent we all want to a couple of things we want to try to avoid we're, everyone's trying to say like can we shrink the travel down can we eliminate as many overnights as we possibly can right and so as our schedules are reflecting that with the with the just conference only schedules and most sports and then trying to pair it so that you're not getting so that your your long trips are all together so maybe you only got to travel once you know, and then and then spreading out the other way, using what you would use in the past as non-conference dates for maybe a conference date with a team that's just across town. You know, so that uh, you know, so that you can you can go there and then come back in a day. And so we're looking at that. But yeah, I am a I'll be I'll be heavily involved in offering my opinion, as they say, with going through that. And so that so that the people on my team, like the gems of of the worlds, that are actually coordinate all the stuff and. And then trying to talk to the coach, hey coach, I need you to do this, so that the, so that I get out in front of that, and I send to the coaches. Jim's going to be coming out to you after our meeting, and look working with you to switch this out, so that all the burden still comes back to me, as the person who's supposed to be running the department, uh, as opposed to Jim, who's just trying to do an incredible job of of making sure that we can do the coverage that we can do, and still, and at the end of the day, we're trying to provide the best experience for our student athletes. And especially this year in several of our sports, where with our indoor sports right now, no spectators, right? So we've got to try to enhance that experience for, for grandma, for Aunt Betty, for Uncle Bob, you know, and for cousin Bill, who are going to be watching a live stream or, or trying to look onto a, whatever platform we're going to have to do that. And so, yeah, I'll be, I'll be heavily involved. 
Jordan, I'm going to put you into this because of facilities and game ops and all that stuff. You know, how much will you be a part of kind of helping out with that process? Yeah, so we, we are obviously a conference affiliated with the Landmark. So our, our conference has kind of set up a schedule for us that, that is conference only. Uh, but we, you know, myself and our AD have been heavily involved in uh, kind of saying this is this is what we think we can handle. We're very fortunate in the fact that we have different facilities that are a bit spread out where we can have access points to different facilities to kind of keep those games separately. So I feel a little more confident with, with where we are having multiple games on multiple day, uh, multiple venues that go on at the same time. But, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, kind of like Lonnie said, it, you, you have to be heavily involved on the front end and say, look, like this is, you know, we typically provide locker room access for all of our teams for, you know, all of our games going on. That might not happen this year. That might be a, you come off the bus, you're at the facility, you, you, you play the game and then you leave. So it's, it's, you know, in the conversations with, you know, kind of making those schedules, those, kind of decisions go into that as well but yeah we've been heavily involved on the front of saying like this is what we think we can handle as just a conference competition schedule and you know we have some situations where we might have to add some non-conference competition for our other sports that are not a part of our main conference but uh it's you know a lot of those things there are a lot of things that lead up to that in involvement of making decisions so we're heavily involved of how we want to kind of maneuver ourselves to say okay this is what we can handle on this day and i think we maybe we need to pull back and move this to a separate day to, to make sure our kids are being safe all righty another question from the group how much risk are you willing to take on with so many unknowns about covid long-term health impacts for example when does the university legal team step in to shut things down denise i'll start with you because you wear both the train the uh, athletic trainer and also the swa hat I have probably monthly meetings with my legal department right now. We've become best friends. <laughs> I didn't know them before this. So I actually have another one on Monday uh, to actually discuss our plans for the spring and moving forward what we're going to do. Uh, so uh, they've been working with us as long as we work within the guidelines of the NCAA. We're kind of just following their recommendations. I know a lot of schools are talking about, well, they're just recommendations. We're not going to follow them. I know that's not a course of action that my my university will take. I just know that they're not willing to take that kind of risk. So if the top medical people within the NCAA and the consultants with the NCAA are recommending certain things, that's what we're going with. And we are not going to get approval to do anything less than that. Kevin, let's go with you on that. Well, I know here in Mississippi, it's uh, the governor said that you could have 50% capacity, but us at Jones, we did not change. We're still 25% capacity. So I think it just varies school by school, state by state. And, you know, we have a president who errs on the side of caution. Um, our athletic director was an ATC, I think, for 18 years. So he's going to be a little bit more different than than my side of it or the, the way I see it because he was in that field for the longest time, but I'm fortunate enough. Uh, my secondary job is I got to, to be a statistician for ESPN. I travel the country every weekend. This year obviously has been terrible, but I do a COVID test every week. And when, when they told us that, you know, I, that my position could not travel, like I was devastated. I was like, I'll, I'll sign a waiver every week. Uh, now I am a diabetic. So obviously there's, there's some, you know, health concerns there for me. Like I'm not, I'm not like oblivious to it. I know it's bad, but it's just like, would I rather be doing something that I love to do and with a mask on or not at all? Like, I mean, I'm, I'll be honest with you guys, like I'm depressed, you know, like there, there's times that I truly am just like, you feel so handcuffed in your job. Like you cannot do what you want to do and you feel like you're underachieving. Like I said earlier, like I'm, I'm so hard on myself as it is. But there's so much anxiety and buildup for everybody. And it's just like when you can't do your job that you love and you can't be around the athletes, uh, it's just it's tough. But we, we you know, we're going to try to follow. I, I'm shocked that we're playing football. I'll be completely honest. We're the only junior college football league in the country playing football here in Mississippi. And somehow we maneuvered through it. We lost some games here and there. But what we made it. I mean, we have two weeks left and I think we're going to make it. But. Uh, I just I think it's, you know, being smart, really. I mean, I know it's nobody wants to wear a mask. Let's get real. Nobody wants to wear it. But, you know, you see all the, the cases spiking right now with uh, just the, the SEC football games alone. And to me, just as looking at it, I think of it's because of Halloween parties like you got to do stuff 
for the for the well-being of everybody else right now like we're a selfish society and right now there's some things that we do not want to do me included that affects everybody else so if we're going to maneuver through this thing like we have to follow uh, whether whether you believe oh it's it's not real or it's real like we have to follow it um, or we're all just going to be miserable and, and just our lives will never go back to normal. Can I touch on something with that? Absolutely. Because Kevin brings up a good point about the mental aspect of all of this, and this is really why even though we weren't having seasons this year, we wanted to get our kids working out in some way shape or form even if it was in groups of 10 even if it was no contact get them on the field get them together give them something to do and i think that some of that sometimes outweighs some of the other risks because the mental illness that's happening right now our counseling center is loaded like you can't get an appointment and they've added counselors to their staff so it's i think from the mental perspective, more so than I know a lot of people are like, it's division three athletics. Why do people care so much? Why are you putting people at risk? I think a lot of it is because you're helping a lot of people too. So it's trying to find that balance and the athletes are going stir crazy being in their house since March. So I think that that's an important point. So I'm glad Kevin brought that up. Yeah, I was going to piggyback that off as well. I mean, for us, we're obviously in Washington, D.C., and what we found is providing them opportunities to have practice and gathering those teams is actually helping keeping them safe. I mean, this is otherwise. These are student athletes in, you know, the District of Columbia that have a lot of opportunities to do a lot of bad and make a lot of bad decisions. So giving them a chance to not only help their mental health, their mental health, but also kind of keeping them out of trouble, honestly, and keeping them engaged and, and making sure they're still interacting with their teammates has is, is been huge for us and, and really been helpful for us to, to have our the people that are on campus say, okay, we have, you know, this, this is a gathering we can do safely. We know we can kind of do things that way. It keeps us some other bad decisions that we may make as college students. Great point. No doubt about it. Well, we're at the top of the hour. We like to keep these right around 60 minutes and we could go on for another hour at that. So we do have some questions that are still in the queue. What we're going to do is we're going to get these out to our panelists and we're going to let them, you know, answer it and we'll we'll figure out a way to get it out to everybody. But boy, I tell you what, some great, great conversations, some great ideas, some great thoughts. And, you know, on behalf of COSIDA, I want to thank, you know, Lonnie and Jordan and Kevin and Denise for joining us and taking an hour out of their day today because, you know, these guys are on the front lines and they're seeing it and they're giving a different, you know, perspective that sometimes, you know, we don't get an opportunity to see. So, we want to thank you guys so much for participating and being a part of this session. I just want to remind everybody that you can find this webinar on demand later on this afternoon um, on Cosida.com and on Cosida's YouTube channel. It'll also be in a podcast, for, podcast format. All the links will be on the Cosida.com website. All the on-demand options are free of charge. We want to thank you for joining. Now, just a reminder, and you see the slide here. We've got some more great stuff coming up for everybody next week. On November 17th, Racing for Impact, this is the part two part of it. This is going to be for Division One members, but believe me when I tell you, anybody could watch this. This is going to be great. It'll give you another set of eyes, another set of perspectives, this time more on the Division One level. It's going to be at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central. Make sure you guys check that out. Also, on Thursday next week, Critical Conversations, how communicators can become effective allies. And what a great panel this is gonna be as well. Once again, same time, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. on the central time zone. So, you know, we've got a lot of great things coming up for our membership, you know, here over the next uh, week or so as we lead into the Thanksgiving holidays. So once again, thank you to our panelists. We wanna thank you for tuning in. And once again, we also wanna thank our great friends at Capital One, they're our corporate partner and our presenting sponsor for COSIDA's Continuing Education Series. I'm Jim Powers. Thanks so much for, you know, giving us an hour of your day today, and we hope you all got something out of it. Thanks so much, and if we don't see you before Thanksgiving, have a great Thanksgiving season, everybody.